Hello again to my junior high students. Welcome back for another week, another lecture. We're trying a new background today. The lighting is a little better in here. Plus, maybe you just like to look at something different behind me for a few weeks. So I thought I'd move it in here. Hopefully this past week, you have all, first of all, chosen a topic for your argumentative essay. I gave you some examples, dog versus cat, um, wearing a bike helmet versus not. One I forgot is, is like push mowers versus riding lawn mowers. Um, something like that, something you can have an opinion on. Something that you're not just giving me information about, but that you can actually have an opinion on. I think this is better. And then I want you to tell me why. And I want you to tell me why in three broad categories. Um, lawn mowers are better than push mowers because of convenience. Could be a broad category. And then you could list all the ways in which it's more convenient. Um, obviously, um, it, 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 lawn mowers tend to mow a larger section faster, um, especially if you have a large lawn. Uh, another thing could be, um, accommodation to people's health. You know, um, you could say that if you have um, health issues or mobility issues, riding mowers help you get more done in a way that push mowers, you might not be able to use them. Um, what's another broad category on that? Um, expense. I don't, riding lawn mowers are a lot more expensive. I don't know that they're less expensive to operate. So that might be kind of going on the side of push mower. Um, or says wear and tear on your body, um, potential for accidents, things like that. So what you're looking for are um, points that support your opinion. If you come to me and you're trying to convince me that your opinion is right, what what are you going to say? How are you going to how are you going to convince me? Convince me. All right, so hopefully you have got your, uh, at least your body paragraphs done. If you have a rough draft and you would like to send it to me and let me go over it and then give you some feedback, I'll be very glad to do that. I wanna help you uh, be successful in this as much as possible. I wanna remind you what goes in your introduction and conclusion because you'll be working on those this week. Remember, we always write the body paragraphs first then the introduction and conclusion because it's easier to introduce something you've already written. And so um, remember in our introduction, we're going to uh, capture attention. Remember a couple weeks ago, I sent you a worksheet with the dramatic hooks, the dramatic openers. There were lots of examples there of ways you can catch attention. We want to give whatever background information we need to. Uh, for example, if you're, you're saying cats make the best pets, you might want to mention some of the many pet options that are available and that you think cats are superior. Then you're gonna name three reasons, your three topics from your three paragraphs. In the introduction, you're going to repeat the three key reasons why your opinion is right, and then give me the one that's most significant and why. Remember, this is sort of an opinion thing. It's your opinion that it's more significant, but uh, give me a reason why. Don't just say, this is most important. Tell me why. Uh, the, the, the clincher reason why cats make better pets is ease of care. You don't have to walk them. You don't have to take them outside to go to the bathroom. Um, they don't tend to just randomly poo on things in your house. Um, shedding is kind of uh, dogs versus cats. It's kind of even there. Okay, but you tell me what you think is most significant and why. And like I said, if you get a rough draft done and you want to make sure that it's good before you turn in a final draft, just run it by me. Just send me an email saying rough draft and I'll look over it, I'll, I'll see that, that um, subject heading, rough draft, and I'll know I need to look at this right away and get back to you as soon as possible, all right? So your five paragraph argumentative essay is due next week. You have another week to work on it, and remember, I'm here to answer questions anytime. 
I urged all of you last week, all of you second year students, but even the first year ones, if you're feeling pretty good about the, the openers that we're already doing, to try a number six opener, the very short sentence. It's not really an opener, it's the whole sentence. But try doing a very short sentence, a sentence of five words or less, for dramatic effect. And you can consult the sheet I emailed out to all of you last week to take some to look, look at some examples of that. All right, this week I have sent out to you a worksheet. Now you second year people have seen this worksheet from last year, but it's always worth reviewing some of these points. And I thought it would be good for my first year students to look at. It's um, called uh, Possessive Pronouns and Other Tricky Words. And I would like you to pause the video if you don't have it already, go get the worksheet, print it out if you haven't already printed it out. Also grab your Dorothy Mills book um, and, and bring it along and something to write with and meet me back here. Okay, I'm assuming you did that. All right, grab the worksheet. It's, there's actually two pages. Uh, and so grab the one that says rule five, possessive pronouns versus contractions, okay? So the very first thing that they show you on this worksheet is possessive pronouns. Usually when a noun is possessive in English, we use an apostrophe S. If I say this is Mary's table, we put an apostrophe S at the end of Mary. Apostrophe S shows that someone owns something. We do not do it when it is plural. Some papers I get, we are, we are using an apostrophe S to make it plural. No, 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 no. All right, apostrophe S means possession. That's what makes this rule five so difficult because when it's a possessive pronoun, when it's its, theirs, yours, ours, even though it's possessive, it does not have an apostrophe. All right, um, a big culprit in this regard is the word its. If you put an apostrophe in its, it means it is. That means if, you know, I'm gonna grab my whiteboard here, just a second, and I'm gonna scoot over. Okay, that means um, the dog loves its, let's do it this way, bone. If I write it this way, this means it is. And what I have written is the dog loves it is bone. That is not what you mean, is it? That is not what you mean, all right? You mean it's, all right? Make sure, just be careful. And when you use it's, Decide whether you really want to say it is. Because if you don't want to say it is, don't use an apostrophe. All right? they give you another, um, a couple of other ones there, theirs. When you say theirs with an apostrophe, you mean there is. Whose, who with an apostrophe S means who is. Like, who's going to go get dinner? Who is going to go get dinner? Be careful on that, all right? Now, there's some other words on this sheet that are just plain old tricky words. They just they just get people. You know, many adults abuse these. So you can be better than the adults that abuse these. First one is then and than. Now, probably almost all of you have had me correct this on your paper at some time or another. Then is a time word. I ate breakfast. Then I did the dishes. I did this first. I did this second. There's time involved. Then, with an A, is a comparison. This flower is more beautiful than that flower. We're comparing. So, uh, more than, greater than, less than. 
but then means you're talking about time. Okay, so watch that. Uh, then there is our trio of theirs. There, there, and there. We have there, T-H-E-R-E, -E, it is the opposite of here. He is here, she is there. All right. Um, there, T-H-E-I-R, means it belongs to them. This is their house. Their, T-H-E-Y apostrophe R-E, means they are. It's a contraction. Now, this also, interestingly, pops up in a lot of papers. All right. All right is two words. It is all right. In other words, everything's okay. It is all right. Not all right, one word. A lot is also not one word. It is a lot. Right. Among and between. A lot, a lot of people don't realize this. Among is something you use when you have three or more uh, objects involved. Between is just with two. So um, they have the example, she divided the money among the three of us. We don't say between the three of us. It would be between the two of us. If it's more than two, it's among. And by the way, we don't say between you and I because between is a preposition and it takes an object and me is the object case. So we say between you and me. Okay, like is a preposition and it can be followed only by a noun or a noun phrase. As or as if begins a clause. Okay. She sang like a nightingale. She was like a nightingale. But you can't say he listened like he was under a spell. Because he was under a spell is a clause. It's got a verb and a subject. It's as if he was under a spell. I don't know. This is English is so tricky, and it's the more you read, and the more you read really good books, the better your grammar gets. That's just the way it works. The more you're exposed to language being used well, the better your language will get. That means choose books wisely, choose books with a high caliber of language, and stay away, frankly, from blogs and computers and texting, and because people abuse language that way, and you just kind of absorb it. So don't, don't uh, absorb more of that than you have to. Um, so I, I sent you another page, and it's practice sentences. What I would really like you to do is pause the video, take out the practice grammar rules five and six tricky words, and I want you to take your pencil and take a few minutes and see if you can find where all the errors are. Now, there are some of them that there are no errors in. All right, just because you can't find a mistake in that sentence doesn't mean that you're wrong. But take a few minutes and go through all of those sentences and see if you can find what mistakes there are. Then turn the video back on and I'm going to go over them with you. All right, I'm going to assume you've done that. So, <clears throat> sentence number one. The gun deck was wet because its walls were full of cracks. Now, we learned on the other side of the sheet that it's with an apostrophe means it is. So it, what this really says is the gun deck was wet because it is walls were full of cracks. Is that what it means? Is that what they mean? They wanted possessive. So we wanted an it's with no apostrophe. If you're not sure why that's true, look on the, look on the rule again. Okay. Puritans made all of their own clothes. Hmm. The clothes belong to them. They are their clothes. So they wanted a possessive, T-H-E-I-R. They used the wrong there. Who's the town crier? Okay, that who's is possess possessive. Like whose is this sweater? What they really wanted to say is, who is the town crier? 
and they wanted a contraction for that. So they needed W-H-O apostrophe S. Whose? Who is? Puritan rules at mealtimes were stricter than they are today. All right, now there's a then. I realize that they're talking about a time period here, something back then, but think about what they're really saying. They're comparing stricter rules back in those times versus not very strict rules today. These rules were stricter than those rules. They're comparing. So we should have used than, T-H-A-N. Number five, Puritans did not believe that it was all right to squander time. We just learned that all right is not one word. It is all right. A lot of Puritans believed in witches. We just learned that a lot is not one word. It is a lot. There's much to do on a New England farm. Okay, the only suspicious word there is theirs. All right, theirs, the way they wrote it, it means there is. So let's test it. There is much to do on a New England farm. Yeah, that one doesn't have any mistakes. Good for you if you figured out it doesn't have any mistakes. The work was shared between all the family members. Okay, unless they only have two family members, we learned that we use among if we have three or more. The work was shared among all the family members. Okay, so th this is not an exhaustive list of all the problems you can have in the English language. And I try not to um, pounce all over your papers. When I see mistakes being made, I, I try to just focus on uh, certain things that I think are the most important things for us to attack for, for each of you. But keep these in mind. These are, you know, when you write and you write well, well, let's, let's change that. When you write and you don't write well, people judge you on that. Now, it's not a moral failing to not write well. It doesn't make you a bad person. God doesn't love you less. But, but people judge it. They judge your, um, your ideas by the way you present them. So because as Christians, we know the truth and we have good ideas to present, let's learn to present them in the best way possible. All right? So this week, keep those rules in mind. Try a very short sentence in each of your paragraphs. Remember, introduction and conclusion also should have all the dress-ups in the openers. Last week, you received a checklist with all five paragraphs listed on it. Remember, if you are having trouble, you know, if you're just keeping up with the openers that you're doing, or I'm just, I'm just having you do dress-ups right now, just keep doing what you have been doing. But, um, but if you feel like you can step up your game a little bit, uh, go ahead and, and do the VSS, the number six opener. Also, big shout out to all of you who are alliterating and using triple extensions. I notice. Good job. All right. I love, to, I love it when I see people putting things in action, the things that we've talked about here. Okay. So now let's grab your Dorothy Mills book and let's take a look at, oh, let's take a look at the plague. That's not a very nice thing to take a look at, is it? It's kind of fitting since we're all sort of huddling inside from this virus. Um, we read the first part of chapter 22 this week. If your book looks like this, it is page 366. If it doesn't, it's chapter 22. All right. And I want to mostly go over this chapter that says, uh, this section that says the Black Death and the Passing of Feudalism. First of all, I'd like to talk a little bit about the 1300s before the plague came around. You've probably heard people talk today about global warming. 
that the average temperature seems to be increasing and people uh, are concerned about why that might be. But did you know it's happened before? The temperature of the planet just seems to fluctuate every few hundred years or so. And um, in the years before 1300 or so, it had been quite warm. There had been global warming. In fact, I think we might have mentioned this with the Vikings. Uh, the world just got warmer and the Scandinavian countries weren't ice locked for part of the year anymore. Uh, the water was, was thawed and they were able to travel by boat year round, which led to more Viking marauding. All right, that was kind of a downside of the world being warmer. But the upside was the growing season lasted much longer. So they had a lot more time to grow crops and sometimes they could grow two rounds of crops in one growing season. Well, what happens when you have more crops? You have more food. And what happens when you have more food? You have the ability to feed more people. So the population tends to grow. P people are healthier Pe and there are more people just because there's plenty of food. Well, around the year 1300, the temperature started to swing the other direction. And it started a 500 year period that historians call the Little Ice Age. It's not like the movie Ice Age, you know, where there's ice and snow, but the average temperature was cooler. And it meant the growing season was shorter. And it meant they could grow less food because of that and it meant they could feed less people because there wasn't as much food. When it first started out, it was, it was not so much snow. It never was super snowy, icy, but it was wet, cold and wet. And so uh, those first few years, they might have crops in the field and the, and the dampness and, and the cold made them rot in the fields and they couldn't harvest. But after this happened year after year after year, people started to get hungry. There was not enough food to feed everyone. And eventually famine resulted. And there are estimates that 10% of Europe died of famine in the early part of the 1300s, which is what we call the 14th century. So imagine that 10%. So if you have a, out of every 100 people, 10 of them die. That, that's a lot. That's a lot. And that's no plague involved here, just famine. So maybe keep in mind that that's something that's going on at the same time. Okay? Um, another thing that's going on that we're going to talk a little bit about next week is uh, people are starting to question the church, the Roman Catholic Church. During much of the 1300s, the Pope didn't even live in Rome anymore. The King of France had made his own Pope, made a Frenchman Pope, and moved him to a town called Avignon. And he ruled the church from there, and basically he did whatever the French King told him to do. So people were not happy. People were questioning the church. Like, who? what's going on? Why does the Pope not live in Rome anymore? I thought he was the Bishop of Rome. So people are troubled by that. People are troubled by famine. People in England and France are troubled by the Hundred Years' War, the beginnings of the Hundred Years' War. Coming into that, a plague spread across Europe in the middle of the century. Um, and it says in your book, um, here at the, in 1348, a plague known as the Black Death swept over Europe. The pestilence spared no class of society, but the death rate was much higher wherever men lived closely together in communities, right? This makes sense. Big cities get hit harder because there's more people packed in a smaller area. And the greatest sufferers were the monasteries and the manors because there were a lot of people close together. Also in the monasteries, they treat the sick, right? Those were the hospitals. Now it says in your book, it has been estimated that in England, France, and Italy, at least one third of the population died. Now, books I've read say anywhere from one fourth to one half of the population of Europe died. I want to put that in perspective. 
it's been estimated or ba based on the estimation of how many people were living in Europe at the time that's 19 to 38 million people died 19 to 38 million people and this thing went fast this was nothing like the virus that we're dealing with now this might kill you in 24 hours and it killed about 50 percent of the people who got it at least 50 percent of the people who got it unlike the virus that we have now this this was horrible and it, it whole towns died i read one um uh, excerpt from a book that they found it was in a monastery and the last monk living there was writing well I'm sitting here among the dead waiting for death I will leave this behind to whoever comes after me and it stops and then in another handwriting um, somebody else added on apparently the author died here that's what was going on in Europe it was awful so when a fourth to a half of the population dies it changes things and as a matter of fact it changed things for hundreds of years I, I've read estimates that it took until the year 1800 for Europe really to uh, reach the population level that it had in 1300 because famine on top of plague now how did this thing spread you probably heard about this um, it was a um, uh, virus on fleas on rats as far as we can tell so these rats uh, on ships in Asia in China coming over trading with Italy trading in Venice um, they uh, would dock and the rats would come off the ships and the fleas would jump off the rats and they'd get on people they'd get in their clothes bite them and uh, it spread apparently it could also spread just by coughing you know after somebody had it but it could probably came on the fleas and it was it was horrible it was horrible so um after so this this went on maybe maybe four or five years till till it slowed down and things got back to normal by the way a couple weeks ago i sent you a map a plague black death map and it had lines showing the spread you might want to grab that map and take a look at that again just review that so looking back in your dorothy mills book it says the result to the manor remember the manor would be like the nobleman's house and all of the fields around it the outbuildings the serfs who were attached to his land who grew his land the knights that he kept in his household to serve him militarily this would be the whole population of the manor the result to the manor was that there were not nearly enough serfs to do the work why because they died and the lords were only too glad to get anyone to work for them on any terms whatever right they need workers why do they need workers so bad because they need to eat and it's not something the nobleman does you don't send your your family out or your knights to go out and farm or garden they were looking for workers but all the workers had died now this is a little economics lesson what happens when there's a great demand for a worker let's say um, you build cars I know cars are built by groups of people say so you personally build cars all right and um, suddenly there's a lot of people who want cars but there aren't very many people who make cars I've been shopping all over town and I can't find people who make cars uh, apparently a bunch of them died in the plague and, and I can't find them finally I found somebody to make me a car they could charge you a lot of money because there aren't very many people doing it there aren't very many serfs farming anymore and they know the Lord and the rest of the residents of the manor need them and they're gonna charge you for it when there are fewer workers wages go up so I was looking at a book about this it's estimated that 
English common laborers, okay, uh, foresters, just some common worker with his hands. In 1347, before the plague, he got paid two shillings a week. Two. Two years later, in 1349, he got paid seven shillings a week. That's more than three times more. By 1350, he was getting paid 11 shillings a week. That's almost six times as much in three years because they were all dying and there, there just weren't enough to go around and they could charge what they wanted. Does that make sense? So um, it says in your book, the old prohibition that the serf might not move from one manor to another was disregarded. They went wherever they could get work. Serfs went wherever there was plenty of work and they began to demand money for wages, okay? So not, I don't want just a share of the produce anymore. <clears throat> you can pay me some cash for farming your land, Mr. Nobleman. This new condition of things put a hope into the serf that he might materially better his condition and live in greater comfort. Hey, maybe I can move out of the low class. Maybe I can become middle class. And in several places, revolts of the serfs broke out, which we'll talk about in a minute. Okay, so workers on your land, migrant farm workers, are charging three times, six times what they used to charge. All right, now be the nobleman again. You have to shell out lots of money to pay these serfs. But because there are fewer people, there are fewer people to buy your goods. So say maybe you take part of your produce and you take it to the farmer's market. Prices are low there because there aren't very many people to buy it. There's more supply than there is demand. If you have houses that you rent out, well, there aren't very many people out there to rent it and you can't charge very much. It's, it's hard to find people to rent. Prices are low and wages are high. This is a very bad thing for the nobleman. But it, it works really well for the serfs both directions. So I hope you're starting to see why the second title of this section was The Passing of feudalism. Because remember feudalism, this system that we've seen in place for this whole, m m much of the school year that we've been together. The idea that you have uh, vassals under lords and the vassal has, has a, a, a lord under him with a manor and he has serfs, they're tied to the land. This is how we're all tied together. Now we have serfs just going out and looking for work. We have great noblemen who aren't such great noblemen anymore because they're losing money. They can't they don't have the income they used to have. Things are starting to fall apart a little bit. And in a couple of places, in England and in France, things really fell apart. They um, talked about, uh, the next section in your Dorothy Mills book, a peasants' revolt in northern France. Remember, the peasants are not just upset about famine and black death. And, and wages and all of this, France has also been ravaged by the first round of the Hundred Years' War. And remember what English troops do. They march through France, and if they can't have it, they burn it. So crops get burned in the fields. Buildings get burnt down. Many men have died in battle. Okay, it's kind of ugly. And so there was a group of, of peasants, and there was a name, a nickname for peasants in France was Jacques Bonhomme which meant Silly Jack. They called them Silly Jacks. So they call this revolt the Jacquerie, the sort of the uprising of the Jacks, the Silly Jacks, because they were tired of being silly. They were tired of circumstances the way they were. There's not enough food. On top of it, the French king keeps raising taxes, tell them they have to pay taxes for the war. Well, they don't, they don't even have food. And so they, they rose up and killed, killed the people. 
Um, there's a picture in your Dorothy Mills book, uh, the Jacquerie, a massacre of a noble, and they're taking an ax to this poor fellow on his horse. Sort of shades of what's going to, you know, a, a, a pale shade of what's going to look like the French Revolution later on. Now, this also, oh, oh by the way, I want to say something about these, these French peasants. They're not, um, and also the English peasants, they're not just run-of-the-mill peasants. These guys are seasoned soldiers from fighting in the Hundred Years' War. They're not just randomly running around with pitchforks. These guys have weapons. They're soldiers. An uprising from these guys, this is a serious matter. Okay, so this happened in France. It also happened in England, where they were also, they kept raising the taxes to pay for the war. They kept arguing with the, with the Pope over the Pope's power over them, just like they were in France. And uh, so they um, took two forms. Uh, first of all, it talks about um, this man named John Ball. It says he was a lollard preacher. You're going to hear about the lollards this coming week in your reading. They're, they're followers, adherents to the teachings of a man named John Wycliffe, one of the very earliest reformers of the church, sort of a herald of the Protestant Reformation that we're going to talk about next week. Um, so he was a, a, a Lollard preacher, a follower of Wycliffe, but he had very, um, he went way farther than the French peasants who just basically wanted to get out of some of the taxes and wanted some food to eat and were sick and tired of the noblemen lording it over them. John Ball wanted to eliminate titles like no nobleman, everyone's in the same class. Okay, I hope you see how huge a jump that is. And so there's a section that they printed in the, in the Dorothy Mills book. He had a little saying, <clears throat> when Adam delved and Eve span, who was then the gentleman? Okay, what does this mean? When Adam delved, means when he was using a spade to dig in the earth, work the garden, and Eve span, like spun wool, was making clothes. When Adam delved in Eve's span, who was then the gentleman? Was there nobility in the Garden of Eden? Were, were there dukes and earls and lords? Were there serfs? No. Everybody was the same. Everybody was equal. That's the way God intends it. This is what John Ball says. It was revolutionary. And so I'm going to read the section here that, that Dorothy Mills uh, recounts from one of his sermons. Ah, ye good people, the matters goeth not well to pass in England, nor shall not do till everything be common. In other words, we all own everything together. And that there be no villains. By this he doesn't mean bad guys, he means peasants. Nor gentlemen, but that we may be all united together and that the lords be no greater masters than we be. What have we deserved, or why should we be thus kept in servage? We be all come from one father and mother, Adam and Eve, whereby can they say or show that they be greater lords than we, saving by that they cause us to win and labor for that they dispend. How are they better than us? Oh, well, because we work for what they spend. They are clothed in velvet and camlet, furred with grease, and we be vestured with poor cloth. They have their wines, spices, and good bread, and we have the drawing out of the chaff and drink water. They dwell in fair houses, and we have the pain and travail, rain and wind in the fields, and by that cometh of our labors, they keep and maintain their estates. All that stuff we do out in the wind and the rain, that's what keeps them alive. We be called their bondmen, and without we do them service, we be beaten. If we don't do what they say, they beat us. And we have no sovereign to whom we may complain, nor that will hear us, nor do us right. Let us go to the king. He is young, and show what servage we be in, and show him how we will have it otherwise, or else we will provide us for some remedy either by fairness or otherwise. Let's go to the king. Let's tell him our problems. And if he won't listen, 
we'll fix it somehow. We will provide us some remedy, either by fairness or otherwise. All right, the king was Richard II, the king that we talked about last week. He was only 14. He had uncles helping him rule who were more interested in their own power than in Richard. And this just got worse and worse until it came to full-blown revolt under a man named Watt Tyler. We don't know a lot about who Watt Tyler is. He's famous for this, leading the Peasants' Revolt. They attacked the palace of one of Richard's uncles, John of Gaunt. They killed the Archbishop of Canterbury. They killed a bunch of people. Finally, they went to the king. The king met them out in the field and um, talked to them. They were, they were gonna slaughter them all and the king's like, no, just wait. I'll go, let me talk to them. And remember what they were wanting. They were wanting to abolish all um, titles of nobility. Richard agreed with them that there could still be a king. They probably should still be a king. And that everybody's equal. Uh, he makes them a bunch of promises. Yes, 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 we'll do whatever you want. Yes, yes. He doesn't keep the promises. He probably doesn't intend to keep the promises. Even if he did, his uncles wouldn't have let him keep the promises. And so we don't know what happened. But he made the promises, and then very shortly after that, like within an hour or two, um, either somebody threatened Watt Tyler, Watt Tyler thought he was going to be threatened, something happened, he drew his sword, we don't know, Watt Tyler ended up dead. I sent you a picture, that's the other, the other thing in your... Um, homework packet that I emailed out to you. A picture, it's an illustration from this Chronicles of Jean Froissart. Um, the guy, uh, you've probably seen in the footnotes, Chronicles, Froissart, and uh, of all the sections that Dorothy Mills has reprinted, including what I just read to you. Uh, this is an illustration from that book. And it is the death of Watt Tyler. The guy in the middle of the picture with the crown is the king, is Richard. You can see his knights getting ready to attack, and, and somehow something happened, and Watt Tyler ended up dead, which pretty much put a damper, an end, not a damper, an end on the Peasants' Revolt. Just to, just to, so you can get an idea of what's going on at the same time, at the same time, Chaucer is writing in England. The, our, remember our Chaucer storybook, The Canterbury Tales? I'm sorry, we're going to listen to my clock ring two o'clock. It's just like being at my own house, isn't it? Um, some of you really love the clock when we meet here, I know. Um, so this is the time of Chaucer. This is the time of the Canterbury Tales. Chaucer was actually a government official during this time. He probably witnessed the approach of the Peasants' Revolt to London. He lived in a building on um, the Tower Bridge. He was a, a I don't know what his official title was, but he dealt with taxes and, and he was a government official and he had government quarters there that he lived in. So we're, it's been speculated he was a, had a front row seat to this peasant revolt. So with stuff like this going on, the feudal system where everyone knew his place. Some people are above me, some people are below me, unless I'm a serf, which nobody's below me. And it, the place doesn't really change. That's, that's disappearing. That's starting to break up. Another thing that's starting to change things is more and more people, you know, these, these the, even the lower classes, there's fewer people, they're getting more money, they're making more wages, they're actually making money, not just produce, they can buy things. And so this whole merchant class is arising, people who sell wine and leather goods and things. And, and they actually raise themselves up and, and form a middle class. You have a group of people that have money that aren't noble, aren't of, of noble descent, aren't aristocratic families. And this all serves to sort of tear apart the foundations of feudalism. It must have been a very scary, confusing time to live. People must have wondered what was going to happen next when famine and plague and the Pope isn't in Rome and, and uprisings of the peasants and people who want everything to be equal and you just don't know what's what anymore. It must have been a very difficult time to live. 
Let's take a look back in our Dorothy Mills book. Um, I'll just read the ending of that uh, section one. The peasants still worked for landlords. They were still dependent on the landowner. They were still poor, but they were no longer serfs. A long period was to go by before they were regarded as citizens with equal rights to the townsmen and before they were allowed to vote. But with the passing of the serf from English life, one of the distinctively medieval characteristics had disappeared. Things are changing. Now, for next week, I want you to finish chapter 22, which means you are finishing the Dorothy Mills book. And we are going to read about John Wycliffe, who, as I said, was a forerunner of the Protestant Reformation. And we're going to talk a little bit more about the Protestant Reformation, more than she talks about it in your book. I'm going to give you some um, idea of what that's all about and why we have Methodist churches and Lutheran churches and Baptist churches. Why are there so many? We'll discuss that next week. So for next week, finish the Dorothy Mills book. Okay, finally, let's take a look at the Joan of Arc book. Oh, I hope you're enjoying this book. It, I think it's a beautiful book. This was a sad portion. The portion you read this past week had her greatest triumphs, but it ended with defeat, with wounding, and with capture. And unfortunately, it's not going to have a happy ending. I don't think that's a spoiler. I think you guys knew that already. There's a couple of sections I wanted to look at with you. The first section was at the end of the chapter about the Battle of Pate. Uh, this, was a, this was a great, great rout, a great victory for France. It was considered one of Joan's crowning achievements. In fact, Mark Twain, in the words of the Sour de la Conte, uh, tells us so. I want to read that section too. But this is what he says about that battlefield. This was not the last time I saw the Maid of Orléans on the red field of Pate. Toward the end of the day, I came upon her where the dead and dying lay stretched all about in heaps and winnows, windrows. Our men had mortally wounded an English prisoner who was too poor to pay a ransom. And from a distance, she had seen that cruel thing done and had galloped to the place and sent for a priest. And now she was holding the head of her dying enemy in her lap and easing him to his death with comforting soft words, just as his sister might have done, and the womanly tears running down her face all the time. This is the heart of Joan of Arc, as she is portrayed to us in this book, a heart of compassion, doing a job that she didn't necessarily want to be chosen for, but it was given to her, and so she did it, but yet, she didn't want to see English dead. She just wanted to see free France. And so she had uh, a great, great compassion. There's a footnote there that says this, this story was discovered in the deposition of Joan of Arc's page, her secretary, de Conte, who was probably an eyewitness to the scene. Um, by the way, I forgot to mention something last week, and it rem is reminded me because it's in the footnote here. The rehabilitation. This book keeps mentioning in the rehabilitation. I'm going to explain to you what that is. Joan of Arc, well, this is kind of a spoiler, I, I think you know the story of Joan of Arc already. Joan of Arc is going to be condemned as a heretic. But I, 20 to 30 years after her death, her case was reopened by the church in France. And all the testimony of her trial was gone over. And they called in new witnesses. And they realized she had been wrongly condemned. And they overturned the condemnation. This is the rehabilitation they keep talking about in this book. A trial that's going to come, unfortunately, too late for Joan. 
but it will clear her name of any taint, of any smear of scandal or wrongdoing or evil. Now, I think the next chapter, this is chapter 31 of book two, is the most beautiful chapter in this book. And I would like to read it out loud to you. Joan had said true. France was on the way to be free. The war called the Hundred Years' War was very sick today. Sick on its English side, for the very first time since its birth, 91 years gone by. Shall we judge battles by the number killed and the ruin wrought? Or shall we not judge, rather, by the results which flowed from them? Anyone will say that a battle is only truly great or small according to its results. Yes, anyone will grant that, for it is the truth. Judged by results, Pate's place is with the few supremely great and imposing battles that have been fought since the peoples of the world first resorted to arms for the settlement of their quarrels. So judged, it is even possible that Pate has no peer among that few just mentioned, but stands alone as the supremest of historic conflicts. For when it began, France lay gasping out the remnant of an exhausted life, her case wholly hopeless in the view of all political physicians. When it ended three hours later, she was convalescent. Convalescent and nothing requisite but time and ordinary nursing to bring her back to perfect health. The dullest physician of them all could see this, and there was none to deny it. Many death-sick nations have reached convalescence through a series of battles, a procession of battles, a weary tale of wasting conflicts stretching over years but only one has reached it in a single day and by a single battle. That nation is France and that battle Pate. Remember it and be proud of it for you are French and it is the stateliest fact in the long annals of your country. There it stands with its head in the clouds. And when you grow up, you will go on pilgrimage to the field of Pate and stand uncovered in the presence of what? A monument with its, heads in the, its head in the clouds? Yes, for all nations in all times have built monuments on their battlefields to keep green the memory of the perishable deed that was wrought there and of the perishable name of him who wrought it. And will France neglect Pate and Joan of Arc? Not for long. And will she build a monument scaled to their rank as compared with the world's other fields and heroes? Perhaps, if there be room for it under the arch of the sky. But let us look back a little and consider certain strange and impressive facts. The Hundred Years War began in 1337. It raged on and on year after year after year after year. And at last England stretched France prone with that fearful blow at Crecy. But she rose and struggled on year after year. And at last again she went down under another devastating blow, Poitiers. She gathered her crippled strength once more and the war raged on and on and still on, year after year, decade after decade. Children were born, grew up, married, and died. The war raged on. Their children, in turn, grew up, married, died. The war raged on. Their children, growing, saw France struck down again, this time under the incredible disaster of Agincourt. And still the war raged on, year after year, and in time, these children married in their turn. France was a wreck, a ruin, a desolation. The half of it belonged to England, with none to dispute or deny the truth. The other half belonged to nobody. In three months would be flying the English flag. The French king was making ready to throw away his crown and flee beyond the seas. Now came the ignorant country maid out of her remote village and confronted this hoary war this all-consuming conflagration that had swept the land for three generations. Then began the briefest and most amazing campaign that is recorded in history. In seven weeks, it was finished. In seven weeks, she hopelessly crippled that gigantic war that was 91 years old. At Orléans, she struck it a staggering blow. On the field of Pate, she broke its back. Think of it. Yes, one can do that, but understand it? Ah, that is another matter. None will ever be able to comprehend that stupefying marvel. 
seven weeks, with here and there a little bloodshed, perhaps the most of it in any single fight at Pate, where the English began 6,000 strong and left 2,000 dead upon the field. It is said and believed that in three battles alone, Crecy, Poitiers, and Agincourt, near a hundred thousand Frenchmen fell, without counting the thousand other fights of that long war. The dead of that war make a mournful long list, an interminable list. Of men slain in the field, the count goes by tens of thousands. Of innocent women and children slain by bitter hardship and hunger, it goes by that appalling term, millions. It was an ogre, that war, an ogre that went about for near a hundred years, crunching men and dripping blood from his jaws. And with her little hand, that child of 17 struck him down. And yonder he lies stretched on the field of Pate and will not get up any more while this old world lasts. Her victory was great, and if only the king had rolled with it and not listened to his advisors who kept whispering in his ear fear and waiting and neglect of duty, digressions and diversions, because Joan just wanted to do it, right? Let's take Paris. Let's do this. Let's. He wouldn't do it. But she, he did do one thing. He got crowned. He got crowned. Now, you might say, well, wasn't he basically king anyway? Did it really matter if he was officially crowned? It really did matter. It mattered to Joan. Um, it says, uh, how did she know that it was so important? It is simple. She was a peasant. That tells the whole story. She was of the people and knew the people. Those others moved in a loftier sphere and knew nothing much about them. We make little account of that vague, formless, inert mass, that mighty underlying force which we call the people, an epithet which carries contempt with it. It is a strange attitude, for at bottom we know that the throne which the people support stands, and that when that support is removed, nothing in this world can save it. To get the support of the people, he needed to go through the ceremony and be officially crowned king. And once the people of France were behind him, supporting him 100%, she knew the tide could turn. So this was so important. This is why it was one of the two tasks her voices gave her, right? Raise the siege of Orléans, crown the Dauphin king. Now, do you remember... Um, we, we talked earlier last week, I believe, that he, he ennobled her family, right? Um, but towards the beginning of the book, when, when they were little children at Domremy, and they were playing at, at battles, and they're like, ooh, what, what would you ask the king if you saved France and you were given a reward? And she said, I'd ask for the remittance of taxes for my town. And she gets a chance to do that. He says, you have saved the crown, speak, require, demand, and whatsoever grace you ask it shall be granted, though it make the kingdom poor to meet it. Now that was fine, that was royal. Joan was on her knees again straightway and said, then, O gentle king, if out of your compassion you will speak the word, I pray you give commandment that my village, poor and hard pressed by reason of the war, may have its taxes remitted. It is so commanded. Say on. That is all. All? Nothing but that? It is all. I have no other desire. But that is nothing. Less than nothing. Ask. Do not be afraid. Indeed, I cannot, gentle king. Do not press me. I will not have aught else, but only this alone. She loves her people. She does nothing out of vain glory. She could have had anything. She could have had anything. And she chose to serve her village as she was serving France. Another portion of the reading you had this week, I loved it when her father came to visit. Her father and her uncle, and they were, they were uh, afraid that maybe she was so great a personage, so noble that they would be too low to associate with her. 
and she took them in and and for one evening she laughed and they told their funny stories about him riding that bull and they had a good time together and she was a young girl again she was a teenage girl she wasn't the general of france okay we read up through book two this week and we ended with the ominous very sad paragraph the 24th of may we will draw down the curtain now upon the most strange and pathetic and wonderful military drama that has been played upon the stage of the world. Joan of Arc will march no more. She acted not in accordance with her voices. She was forced to. She was supposed to stay put and the king wouldn't let her. The king kept dilly-dallying, not doing his duty, not marching forward. And uh, finally, they were besieging a town. You might remember the story. And she, they, the enemy was closing in, and they closed the gates, and she was left outside. And the Burgundian soldiers, the Burgundians, remember, are allied with the English. They're pro-English. They have a deal with the English. She is in their hands now. This next week, I would like you to start in book three, and I would like you to read chapters 1 through 13. All right. And so we're going to be, we have two more weeks reading Joan of Arc. Okay. But this week, book three, chapters 1 through 13. So actually at this point, let me recap all of your assignments for this week. You're going to finish your argumentative essay and, and send it to me next week. You're going to call me if you have any questions or problems. Try not to abuse any of the tricky words or the possessive pronouns that we talked about in the worksheet. Use the worksheet, refer to it if you're not sure what to do. And then um, get it sent in to me, pop some VSS number six openers in, and I welcome all alliteration and triple extensions. And some of you, like I said, are doing that and well done, good job. The second thing I want you to do this week is to finish the Dorothy Mills book. Read about John Wycliffe, and next week we will talk a little bit about the Protestant Reformation. And the third thing is to read in Joan of Arc, book three, chapters one through 13. Until then, you guys know where to find me. Email me, call me. The homework is still being posted on the website, so you can always double check there if you can't remember what I asked you to do. You can always come back and watch the video over or the portions of it that you need to watch again. Um, if you have any questions, get back to me. I'll be on the lookout for it. Until then, you guys stay home, stay safe, stay well, and I'll see you next week. Bye-bye. <laughs>